Have you thought this through? No way will that work. Are you sure? Is there any money in that? You'll never make any money doing that. How are you going to pay the mortgage? Just get a job. Are you going to try to sell that? Why can't you be normal like anybody else? All right. Were your parents warm too? The savvy entrepreneur to the rescue. Congratulations. That really turned out well. I wish I had the courage to follow my friends. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. I hope all you entrepreneurs and small business people are having a great day out there. Settle in. We're going to have a great show for you. I'm Doris Nagel, your host for the next hour. The show has two goals, share helpful information and resources. You know, if I can help just one of you entrepreneurs out there not make some of the mistakes I've made myself or I've seen my clients or friends and family make, then I'm going to consider this a success. The goal, secondly, is to inspire. I don't know about you, but I found it often confusing and sometimes lonely Sometimes you have no idea if you're on the right track or not or where to turn for good advice. So every week I have guests on the show who are willing to share their stories and their advice. And this week's guest is Lydia Varesco Rocoma. She's the founder and owner of Lydia Varesco Design. And she's joined us this week to talk about a topic that is so important for every small business or organization, marketing and branding. And she knows what she's talking about. She's been in business helping organizations with these topics for over 20 years. Lydia Varesco Design, she says, empowers organizations and entrepreneurs to make change through their strategic branding and marketing. She's active in the creative and nonprofit communities here in the Chicago area. She currently serves on the board of directors for the Association of Consultants to Nonprofits, as well as on committees for Association Forum and the Marketing American Marketing Association. Folks, I need more coffee this morning. She is a blogger, a speaker, and leads branding and creative marketing workshops for nonprofits and small businesses all over the world. Lydia, thanks so much for being with me today. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. Thank you so much, Doris. I'm so excited to be here. I'm really glad we got connected and looking forward to talking about branding today. Absolutely. What a topic. As you and I were talking about before the show, if I have to look back at one thing about my own business efforts, and I've had quite a few either on my own or with friends and colleagues that have cratered. It's probably the result of not really thinking through the marketing and the branding side. But before we delve into that, talk a little bit about your business. What does it do and what kind of problems do you solve and who do you do that for? As you mentioned, I've been in business for um, a little over 20 years. I just um, celebrated my 20th anniversary last year. Um, So I've been doing this for quite some time. Um, but I, um, I help organizations discover their who, what, and why. And then I help them to express that through their marketing, through their outreach. So um, the branding is the, the who, what, and why, and then the marketing portion is the actual outreach. So I work with uh, mainly mission-based uh, organizations. So I work with nonprofits, associations, higher ed, social entrepreneurs. Um, I love working with organizations that, you know, really have a mission, especially um, those that are working to make changes here in Chicago and the various Chicago communities. How did you get started in this business anyway? Well, I, you know, it's interesting, like my career path kind of took some twists and turns and sort of made a 360 and came back where I started. So when I started out my career, <laughs> that's hilarious. I gotta yes, hear this. yes, yes, definitely. So when I started out my career, um, I was an intern, I went to Columbia college uh, here in Chicago and I was an intern at a small design studio in the loop. 
And so that design studio actually did quite a bit of work for higher education, as well as like some nonprofit organizations specifically, like we worked on like um, with some conservation organizations, did some like educational publications, as well as working with um, organizations like University of Chicago, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So I was an intern there and then I ended up getting a job there, worked there for a couple of years um, and sort of laid the groundwork for my career. Um, then I kind of took a few different paths. I um, ended up working in the restaurant and hospitality industry um, quite a bit when I first launched my business. Um, so I was working with restaurants and restaurant companies for a while. And then after my first child was born, which was about 10 years ago, I realized that I wanted to do something that would make the world a better place for them. You know, it just kind of changed my whole outlook on the power of design and what design can do. So I kind of started thinking back, like, you know, what did I do, you know, when I started out my career, how can I sort of tie that into this new focus of, you know, having a mission in my work? And I realized, oh my gosh, you know, I got started with these nonprofits and, and higher ed and, and I thought, oh, okay. So I've got that experience. I laid the groundwork. Um, why not kind of go back to that? So I did decide to make that my niche. And really interestingly, um, I found that my business started to really grow and take off at, at that point because I, you know, had really kind of focused and I was really getting to know, especially like the local nonprofit community and different organizations. And it really helped me to get um, a really good perspective on that particular sector because it is different, you know, working with nonprofits and associations and higher ed, it's a little bit different than working in a corporate setting or with a big brand, but I love it. And I really do feel like, um, you know, now I have two children. And so I definitely feel like, you know, my work is making a difference. I do really try to support and work with organizations, especially that help and support women and children. So it's really made my work you know, more fulfilling over the years. Oh, that's great. You know, you said something I'm curious about. Branding and marketing is a little different for nonprofits and organizations like higher ed than small companies. But I'm guessing there are some things that are pretty similar. What would you say in your experience are the biggest differences and what are the similarities? Yes, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that because a lot of times... I feel like people get hung up on the fact of like, we're a nonprofit, you know, we can't really do things the way this bigger business does or this, you know, big brand does. And well, and, I, and certainly I want to just jump in. Certainly yeah. a lot of small companies will say, well, I, that's for fortune 1000 companies. That's not for me. One of the things um, that I've really focused on in my business and become intrigued by is how nonprofits, you know, or small businesses for that matter, can be inspired by these bigger businesses and learn from how they're running their business, how they're working and operating, and then taking some of those aspects and applying them to nonprofits and associations and, you know, mission-based organizations. So that's something that I've made an effort to do over the years is really kind of learn how they can be more targeted, focused, efficient. And, you know, it's really with a, with a business, with a for-profit business, of course, you know, their goal is really more of a financial based goal, a profit based goal, obviously with a nonprofit or with an association it's not necessarily, you know, oh, sales and sell as much as possible, but there still is that financial goal. There's that financial aspect of either increasing the number of donations, increasing mm -hmm. the how large the donations are, growing your membership base, growing your student body. So there's definitely ways to, you know, we approach it differently, but I feel like there's definitely something to be said for being inspired and learning from the for-profit organizations and then applying it, you know, maybe on a smaller scale. I do that quite often with my clients. 
Well, I do think in my experience, the people who can tell an effective story, it almost doesn't matter what business or objective they have. Uh, Maybe it's just selling their book, right? Or um, I don't know, being being an effective radio talk show host, it's, it's almost like, um, it's almost like it doesn't matter. It's just an art form and some people are naturally good at it and some of us not so much. And so my guess is you help more of those people who, who struggle with it and um, maybe aren't, aren't the naturals at being able to do that. Yes, definitely. And I'm so glad that you brought up the storytelling because that really is the key, I think, with why some organizations feel like they're not making a connection with their audience is really that, you know, they haven't been able to tell that story. So what I do in my work is I focus on a brand strategy that is rooted in the who, what, and why of an audience. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, of a brand. So that would be the who would be the audience that they're targeting, the what is the problem that they are solving, and the why is that point of difference, that that thing that makes them different and unique. And that's really where the story comes in. So when I go through this process with my clients, um, it's always really fun to you know, figuring out the audience and sort of the problems that you solve are a little more straightforward, but really diving into that why that I think is where the magic happens. And that's where you start to create the story, um, write the messaging around that story, and then weave that into both your branding as well as all of the marketing that you're creating. Um, so, you know, it really does come down to that who, what, and why. And I put why last because that's where I really want people to spend most of their time. Why do you think, I agree with you, it, it is hard, but why is it so hard, do you think, for well, some of us? I think with, you know, I and speaking from personal experience, it's hard, I think, to think about your own company or your own organization Um, first of all, it's hard because you don't have time. There's so many other things pulling you in different directions and you don't have like that structure or that framework. So what I like to do with clients is, you know, we schedule a call, you know, maybe a few hours. I mean, now, now it's zoom. It used to be using a, you know, a whiteboard in my office, which was always fun because it's always fun to like write things down in different colors. And, you know, now we're using the, the digital whiteboards, which is fine. But it's, it's, that's where I feel like um, it's fun. You know, people get to kind of stop what they're doing and just really think about things and think about their organization and, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. And I, I find that when I do these sessions, people have these really like light bulb moments where mm. it's like, wow, I never realized that about our audience, or I never realized that, you know, we weren't really expressing this part of ourselves. And I think the reason is because we are not, we're not really open to it because we're busy and we're distracted and we're doing our work. (laughs) You know, the branding is not necessarily part of an executive director's work. You know, they have other work they need to do. So I think that's the beauty of someone like me coming in and leading them through this process Um, And then they can really figure these things out that would have been really hard to just do on their own. I I know even for myself, you know, I I don't always set aside the time to do it. When I do, then it's great. You know, I come up with some really great insights. It's funny, the number of uh, consultants that I've had or business advisors that I've had, even as guests on the show, who, um, who always are saying, um, well, that's my website, but it's, it's under construction. So, uh, I've been meaning to get to that. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I could say the same thing. My website is currently being revamped. <laughs> I <Yeah. can> relate. <laughs> exactly. Do as I say, not as I do. I exactly. really know what I'm talking about. Trust me. Well, so 
other than not telling the story very effectively, what are some of the most common branding mistakes you've seen over the years? Yes. So I think not knowing your audience, that's that who, or thinking that your audience is everybody. That's, I think, one of the biggest mistakes. And that's something that I think, you know, everybody can do because when you start out, you know, especially for a small business, if you start out, you just think like, I just want to get business. I want to start, you know, rolling with my business, get new customers. So you kind of lose sight of the fact that not everyone is a good potential customer, nor do you want everyone to be a customer. So you really, you know, it's almost a little bit hard to kind of narrow it down because then you think, oh, what if I'm missing out? And it's the same thing with, you know, say a nonprofit, you know, if they're thinking, well, but we really want to get donors from all different, you know, right places. Yeah. We don't but, want to turn it down. My yes, goodness. Exactly. They want to write a check. We want to take it. Right. 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 But, and that's fine. You know, you're not going to say no to somebody, but as far as where you focus your efforts, that's where you really need to know the audience. So that's, that's actually something I had to learn in my business when I was developing my niche I was a little hesitant thinking like, oh gosh, well, if I say that, you know, this is my niche, then what if someone comes that's not in my niche, do I have to say no to them? Well, no, of course not. You know, if it's still a good fit, then you can still work with that client. But the fact is that you are being more um, focused in your outreach and in your branding and the people that you are attracting to your organization. So, you know, if somebody else comes to you, yeah, it's still a good fit. Great. You're not going to say no, I'm sorry. (laughs) So that's the first one, not knowing their audience Mm -hmm. or thinking everyone is their audience. And I think the second one is not knowing their why. So either, you know, not really being clear on what the story is or, maybe what makes you different, what makes you unique. Um, I think this is something that comes up, you know, again, with small businesses as well as nonprofits. Well, you know, there's a lot of graphic designers out there. So what makes me unique? Or there are a lot of organizations that benefit women and children. What makes this organization unique? So I think that's a really important um, part to consider because it, it can like you said, become a mistake if you're not really conveying that why, you know, that sort of special thing about you um, in your branding and in your marketing. You know, it's interesting. I'm listening to you talk about these mistakes and uh, I can never stop really listening to it and listening through the lens of businesses that I've been associated with either myself, my own businesses or friends, businesses or clients. And I I can never stop it. You know, I I'm always thinking back through those experiences thinking, okay, so where did that business go wrong with their, why or their, you know, their inability to, to focus and focus in on their target clients. And, you know, I have to say that that is one of the hardest things. And, um, I think I'm curious about your perspective on it, but I think it ties into one of my one of my favorite themes, which is do some market research. Yes, because um, you know it's a very scary thing to say. Well, I'm I'm for these. I'm really intending to focus on these clients without focusing on these particular clients. I'm not focused on those. And it's very scary because if you don't know that there's a market for the ones that you're focusing on and that your why is focused on those clients, you need to make sure that before you head down that path too far, you know, that that choice is viable, I guess is a way to put it. It's great to say that I want to have a nonprofit that focuses on uh, salvaging beat up teddy bears. And that's very niche, right? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just making stuff up as I go along here. I like it. (laughs) But but if nobody really cares about salvaging beat up teddy bears and no one wants to donate money for it, well, 
it's not such a great choice. And I may have a great why. I'm very passionate. I love these little teddy bears and I collect them. But, you know, unless people are, maybe people will think, oh, that's really cute. I'm into that. But you don't know, right? Until you've done some market research. Gosh, Doris, we're like so in sync today because that leads directly into the next, the third branding mistake I was going to mention, which is focusing on yourself instead of the problem that you're solving. And I think that's so common, you know, especially it's very common with small businesses because you get an idea, you're excited about it and you build a business around it. And like you said, you know, you put it out there and maybe you haven't really done the market research. You don't even know if what you're offering is viable. And I can see how that easily happens because it's happened to me, you know, where I'm one of those people that always has a million ideas in my head and, oh, I should start <laughs> this side business, and this side business and this product line. How come and, nobody's done this? Right. Yeah. And, you know, I've realized that that's really the key. And it's also true with organizations where, like you said, somebody might say, oh gosh, you know, I really want to support, you know, this particular cause. And it's great because usually people, when they do that, they have a, a personal reason and a connection, mm -hmm. but they might be overlooking the fact that there's already an organization that's doing that. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead you can find a way to partner with that organization or collaborate with them or help them build a bigger organization. You know, and I think that's become very common in the nonprofit sector. So that's why, you know, we're starting to see where some of these nonprofits are coming together to collaborate, to form a partnership, because they're realizing, well, instead of there being, you know, 10 of us <laughs> doing the same thing, can we come together and can right. we form one organization? Can we form a collective impact organization where a bunch of different organizations come together for one cause? So I think that, like you said, Doing that research, you know, whether you are a small business, a nonprofit, a mission focused organization, doing that research into your audience and that problem that you're solving, you know, and sometimes it might actually um, change your business, you know, or your organization. And you'll realize, hmm, I think I need to focus on something else, you know, yeah. kind of like what the pandemic did, you know, with a lot of people where we pivoted our business and we said, Hey, all of a sudden people need, you know, digital branding. Okay. How can I offer more digital branding? So it's kind of staying, I guess, flexible and doing your research, I think is really important so that you are focusing on the problem you're solving, not yeah. on yourself and your exciting new idea. <laughs> Well, right. And I think your point is spot on. Um, and it's certainly one that's a challenge for a lot of businesses, which is that things evolve pretty quickly these days. And the pain point your customer may have been very fixated on two years ago, say when you first started your business or five years ago, may not be their their big pain point at the moment. So mm -hmm. um, you got to stay really close to those customers, whoever that, that, that customer, I guess people call it stakeholder, you know, to be more generic, but whoever, whoever that is, whether it's donors or it's people who are subscribers or it's clients, you know, you got to stay close to them and make sure that you're staying in touch with where their pain points are. Yes. And I think that's a great point as far as branding is concerned as well, because brands change and evolve and, you know, it may be happening kind of in the background and you're not even really thinking about it. So that's one of the things I really encourage with my clients is to do a brand review and maybe you do that yearly, or maybe you check in quarterly. I have like some worksheets that I, um, provide to my clients where you can really just kind of do a quick check-in, you know, and look at the different aspects of your brand, because especially now, I think that people did realize, you know, wow, we need to either maybe change some of our digital outreach, or we need to add to it. We need to add some more touch points because mm -hmm. now we're not able to reach people in person. So we really have to focus on 
more maybe social media or content or, you know, like this, like a podcast or a webinar. So I think that um, really sort of being in tune with it. And, you know, like I said, I know people have a lot on their plate, but if it's one of those things, you put it on your calendar. I think it's a nice thing to do at the end of the year when people maybe have a little slower of a schedule and just do a little brand check-in, you know, I have an audit and see what's going on with your brand. See if anything has changed that you maybe need to make adjustments in some of your visuals or some of your messaging, because, you know, things like that change and especially messaging, you know, I think you may not be changing like your logo every year, but your messaging is definitely changing, especially, you know, now, like during the pandemic, you may have been saying one thing before the pandemic, and now it's a whole different story. So I think checking in at least once a year is a very smart idea. Talk about what happens when a company's branding is not very effective. Yes. I think, you know, one of the things that I've observed with my clients is that they tell me people don't know what we do. (laughs) And that's pretty common. Maybe they haven't really expressed it in a way that resonates with their audience, or maybe what they do is kind of complicated and needs to be explained. Maybe there needs to be some education built around what they do, or maybe they're just not being consistent in their outreach. So there's a lot of different reasons why that can happen. And I feel like it all comes down to really stepping back and looking at that who, what, and why. Maybe your organization, you know, hasn't really thought about it because you're so busy in your day to day, or maybe things have changed. But I I think that really kind of taking a step back and looking at it from how your audience looks at it. Like I will tell people when they do this brand audit that I mentioned, you know, what I have people do is like print everything out, you know, your website, your email newsletter, you know, print it all out and spread it out on a table so you can see it visually. And then I'll say, okay, now show it to your, your partner or show it to your neighbor, you know, maybe somebody who doesn't know about your business or your organization Yes, and see what they say, you know, and sometimes it'll be very clear. You know, I've gone on people's websites where I am just like, wow, I know exactly what this person does. I got a feel for their personality. Yep. You know, there's a picture of them. They're smiling. Like, you know, you can really get it, but then sometimes mm-hmm. you go on a website and you're just like, I have no idea what this company does. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because that is one of my bugaboos. You know, if I met the owners in person, they may have a phenomenal story to tell, but if that doesn't trickle down to their marketing materials, Exhibit one, usually meaning your website, that's not a good thing. I have just been astounded. I've been doing some market research on radio shows and podcasts related to entrepreneurship and women entrepreneurs. I'm doing just what we were talking about, right? I want to expand my business and I want to understand what my competition is doing and whether what I'm doing is unique enough to grow it or whether I need to make some changes. And I am utterly astounded at the number of websites where it says about us, but it doesn't say really like who these people are or why they're doing what they're doing. And some of them, I I'm really not sure what the heck they are. And so I'm guessing there's probably a lot of that out there. You are absolutely right. And, you know, it's funny because I recently was attending like a parenting conference and one of the speakers, you know, I really liked her talk and I went to her website and I thought, wow, this website really expresses who she is, you know, because I had Mm -hmm. seen her listen to her speak And so I kind of, you know, her personality came through and her speaking and then her website really also had that personality. I even, you know, I wrote her an email and I said, you know what, I work in branding and I have to say your website really embodies your brand, you know, because like you said, it doesn't always happen where you 
go onto a website and you're like, yeah, this is really who she is. And I understand what she does. And, right. you know, I think that it really boils down to, you know, we call it the brand positioning and the brand positioning is the who, what, and why, and you're kind of summarizing it into a couple of sentences. And that's, you know, this is one of the things that I help my clients with is developing that brand positioning. And then that serves as guidance for everything that you do, including your website. So then when you're working on your website, if you're, you know, creating a new website or you're revamping it, you can really look back at that and say, okay, is this messaging, you know, the, what I've written, does that really, you know, embody my who, what, and why do the pictures, you know, kind of tell the story, the colors, um, the (laughs) way that my tone of voice, you know, all of those things are really, they're so important to determine before you put everything out there. And I think a lot of times people, you know, just because of the, you know, how it takes a while to put a website together, right? So sometimes you maybe don't have all that figured out and you're putting it out there and you're kind of retroactively right. sort of figuring those it. things out. Exactly, yeah. which is fine. You know, I don't think that's a problem, but I think that, you know, you do want to make sure that you are looking at your website and you're asking yourself, number one, does it visually express who I am? So in the case of this parenting coach, it was, you know, pictures of her and which you know, came her personality came across. And then number two, is it expressing my brand in the messaging? So the headline, the tagline, the body copy, you know, the different sections of the website, um, is that written in this tone of voice? And is, you know, what I'm saying, is that really aligned with what my brand says, you know, that we do? It feels really tricky and overwhelming, but I think it's almost about like simplifying. I think that a lot of people, you know, myself included, which is why I'm revamping my website currently, you know, websites get a little cluttered and you throw so much in there. And I think sometimes you do have to kind of step back and take away and then just really keep the basic elements that are the most important. You know, it's interesting. I think there's one other element of, you're, you're so right. It's interesting how this is all wrapped around human psychology, whether it's your your stakeholder psychology or in, in oftentimes your own as the business owner or founder or, or principal. I, I have seen recently, um, it's interesting that sometimes you will say to somebody, I, I think the website could use some updating. And you'll give some specific examples of why it could be better, but you get resistance, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I, and I've, I've seen that now, I think, with three different things that I, uh, I've worked on um, recently, and, and people just dig in. They're like, it is clear. It's fine. And, and you know... But, I could be off base. Maybe it's just me. And that's definitely a possibility. But uh, but I find it interesting how people, without getting the outside mirror, often just they don't see what what other people see. Yes. And I think that's why, you know, having that outside perspective is so key. And I've really realized this in my years of working with clients. Um, and also, um, you know, you can, you can get that outside perspective by hiring somebody, right. To come in a consultant, to come and help you, but you can also get that outside perspective by surveying your customers. So you can, you know, if you have a sales team, you know, you talk, you have your sales staff, talk to your customers, you know, what do you think about our website? You know, what do you think about this page? And they'll tell you, oh, you know, I always have a hard time finding such and such, or, you know, I really, I'm not sure how to do this. Um, So that's a great way. You know, if it's a, you know, for-profit business and you have a sales team, you know, those are the people that are really in touch with the customers and all they have to do is ask and people, you know, we know human nature, people love to give their opinions. So all you have to do is ask and, you know, you can 
also put together an email survey. If you know, if you don't really have a large team, you can just do kind of a small focus group. I've seen that done quite successfully with um, an association uh, that I'm involved in. They were revamping their website and they asked for, I think maybe like 10 volunteers to join this mini focus group and they would show you the new website and you would get to interact with it and you can offer your opinions. And I thought, wow, that's brilliant because first of all, they're focusing on the member, you know, the member's the one that's using it. And if the member doesn't like it or can't use the website, it's basically useless. Right. So I think really focusing on, you know, those key stakeholders that are going to be accessing your website and, you know, asking them those key questions, like, you know, you can ask them, of course, about the, the usability, which is very important, but there's that emotional aspect of the brand. You know, do you, when you come to this website, do you get a sense of who we are? Do you get a feel, you know, for our mission? Does it connect with you? Do you want to learn more about us? Are you intrigued? You know, yeah. those more of those kind of emotional questions are, are what I want to know when it comes to the branding, you know, the, the user experience is super important, but that's kind of in another category. The, in the branding aspect, it's really that emotional aspect of the, of the website. Well, I hope you entrepreneurs and small business people are listening out there because those are some golden nuggets from somebody who's been in this business a long time. And I think the key takeaway is you need to ask. And I think it's all too easy for people who have lived with a website for a while. They think either, oh, I paid some firm $10,000 to update it. So it's good. Just, you know, let it be. Or they've reached their threshold in terms of dealing with it and just don't want to deal with it anymore. Or um, they've gotten so used to seeing it that they see what they want to see from it. And so asking the questions of your stakeholders, I think is pretty great advice. Let's switch to another topic, which is near and dear to your heart, but I think is one that's a head scratcher for a lot of small organizations, which is media digital marketing. Is there a distinction between digital and non-digital branding and marketing, or are they just parts of the same facets of the same thing. I look <laughs> at it as the multi-channel experience. We talk about both the print and the digital touch points. So in the case of a nonprofit, they have their fundraising appeal, which is, you know, the letter you get in the mail and the envelope that you can send back and the postcard that they send you to thank you for your donation. So those are really those print touch points. But then within that campaign, you also have a digital aspect to it. So you have the social media posts that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. You have the landing page on the website. You have the, the giving page. You know, a lot of nonprofits, they will have a separate giving page maybe mm -hmm. off their website. And then you have the email that you receive. And then maybe, you know, the, the executive director is talking about the nonprofit on a podcast, you know, there's, I look at it as how can all of these different expressions of branding be integrated and work together? So there's definitely a difference in how to approach the two, of course, because print we know is very tactile. I, you know, come from a print background, of course, you know, back when I started, there was no digital branding. We were doing right. everything in print, uh, well, which was and, and you know, I, wonderful. I, I've been hearing it from different places that um, that print media may be making a comeback. Is that something you're seeing as well? Yes. In fact, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I was I just on a call yesterday with a group of fellow uh, creatives, creative business owners, um, and we were chatting with a uh, print um, paper vendor and uh, they were a couple of paper vendors. And so they were talking about um, this kind of resurgence in print because especially now people are feeling like, oh my gosh, you know, we've been cut off. Everything's been online. Everything's been digital. You know, we haven't been getting the mail in our mailbox because we're working at home. We're not in our office. 
And um, they are finding that, you know, more people are turning to print because it helps you stand out. And it well, really- Well, pe- people are, there's so much clutter on social media. And, yes. um, you know, and it, it is noisy. It is hard to be heard. And so I, I'm really not surprised that some people are going back to old school and saying, okay, well, if I can't cut through all the clutter, and I know people who just have, basically, they don't check any of their accounts. They have literally, and that, that's probably not the millennials and, and younger people, but I know a number of people from, you know, the boomers and in between who just are like, I don't check my LinkedIn anymore. I don't look at Facebook. I don't shut down my Twitter. I just don't do that anymore. I got overwhelmed. It's so true. I mean, I think that we've all gotten overwhelmed with the number of digital, um, you know, touch points (laughs) that are out there now. And that's, you know, because that's really how we were all kind of forced to interact. So I, you know, like I said, (laughs) I, I have a print background So I love print and I was excited, you know, yesterday to be on this call and hear them talking about, you know, yes, you know, yes, things are changing in the print world. Um, Maybe they're not making as much paper, but people are still creating those printed pieces. And I think where it becomes most effective is in that multi-channel approach. So for example, with my nonprofit clients on their appeal letter, there's a URL, you know, a personalized URL that that donor can go to to make their donation. And they can track who has donated as a result of getting this letter. Ah. And another way that we've done that with one of my clients is like they're putting out some ads, like CTA ads. And on that call to, ad, call to action, right? Yes. There's again, there's a personalized URL. Because, you know, with, especially with advertising like that, with like billboards, digital billboards, CTA advertising, you can't always track it as easily. Right. So having that personalized URL means, okay, whoever is visiting the website via that URL, we know they saw that, that bus panel, or we know they saw that digital bill, dil, uh, billboard. So I think that um, having the campaigns integrated is really the key. And that's what gets you that brand recognition because people say, oh yeah, I remember I got that letter. And then next thing you know, they're like on Facebook and they see a social media post that features, you know, the same visuals, the same branding from that letter. And they're putting it together like, oh yeah, that's right. I did have that letter. Okay. Maybe I better go and sit down and make my donation. So it's really that ah, multi-channel approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's your advice for getting heard in the noisy, that noisy digital world out there? I mean, it, it really is overwhelming. It's not just personally overwhelming because people get so many emails and pings and pop-up ads and things like that. But it's, you know, for a business that knows it needs to be on social media, How do you sort through all the noise? I think that um, one of the ways to do that is through storytelling. So really getting clear on your story, your particular story of your company or your organization, that why that we've talked about and figuring out, you know, how can we tell that story in a unique way? Something that will stand out and stick with people. And then I think it's also good to think in terms of like a campaign. So instead of saying like, oh, let's just like put something on social media, think about how you can, you can roll it out into a full campaign. So maybe like a, bur- like a Burma shave uh, set of signs. Boy, I yes. am dating myself, but the, but to those of you out there who are older know the, the Burma shave signs where you kind of did it was a series of signs that you would see along the roadside and you had to read each one to kind of get the full picture and story. Right, right. Totally. And they still do. Like, I think I've seen some brands that, that still do that, you know, pretty cleverly on those billboards on the road. Yes, Um, yes. exactly. 
thinking about it in that way. So rather than just a one-off, you're thinking, how can we make this either like a regular feature where, you know, you're posting something every Wednesday or you're making it like an annual event. So in the month of November, we're going to feature our donors, you know, um, like there's, I think the month of April, there's like national volunteer week. So, you know, something like that, or even now that I mentioned that even kind of tapping into these events that are already happening. So we know it's national volunteer week. So let's tap into that and we'll start sharing some stories from our volunteers. So I think, you know, either creating your own campaigns that can be a long-term regular consistent, you know, that means you're going to post every week or whatever you determine, not just like once every two months. And then also getting um, in on some larger campaigns. So like, I like to participate in women's um, small business month. I believe that's November, unless it's happening right now. I can't remember. It's either, um, it's either now or November. Because, right, right. Um, I can't remember either. Yeah. Um, so those, you know, those are some easy ways to help your brand to stand out um, in the noise because there is a lot and, you know, people are having trouble, you know, I know with Facebook, you know, organic engagement is down and, you know, you really kind of have to make an effort. That's why, you know, people are, are reaching out on other platforms. You know, people are doing Instagram and doing right. Instagram reels and TikTok and LinkedIn. You know, a lot of organizations are realizing, Hey, we need to be on LinkedIn, have more of a presence on LinkedIn. And instead of just uh, checking in from time to time, but really start putting your content out there, you know? So um, again, we come back to the research that we talked about and, you know, kind of doing some research into those channels as a whole. Yeah. Where, what, where do your stakeholders gather? Yep, exactly. And if they're, they're not on Facebook or they're not in LinkedIn, don't spend a lot of time there. Exactly. That's where surveys come in handy as well is to ask those customers or those stakeholders, you know, what channel, social channels are you on? You know, where do you follow us? Where would you like to see us? You know? Well, I'm curious, you know, to me, it's difficult. Even the companies that know they need help with marketing and branding, it's not easy to find a consultant that is a good match for the organization. At least my experience has been in the past that there are a lot of folks out there that label themselves a branding or marketing consultant. And in some cases, really all they are is like a social media posting organization, or they're pretty focused on some aspect of it, but they call themselves marketing and branding consultant. How do you sort through all of that noise? What's your advice for organizations to find the right Lydia for them? Well, I think the first thing is to make sure that they really focus on your industry or, you know, your sector. I think, you know, like we talked about websites, if they have like a, you know, a targeted website, that will be quite apparent. You know, I know that I have colleagues that focus on, you know, really specific niches. And so somebody would know like, oh, okay, if I'm looking for someone to help me with, you know, say like I have a colleague that that works on um, companies that are maybe like in the beauty industry or, you know, well, they would probably go to her for branding rather to, than to me. So I think this is where, you know, finding someone who really has that niche and who will understand your challenges, your problems, and will know how to solve them. I think that's the key. So I think either, you know, determining that through a conversation with that person, hopefully looking at their website, seeing samples of their work, seeing what else they're doing. You know, usually people who are really involved in a niche, they also, that kind of carry over, carries over into other aspects of their life. So like in my case, you know, I'm on the board of directors at an association um, for nonprofit consultants. So 
yeah, you can see I'm like pretty committed, you know, to this nonprofit right. and association world. Right, right. So just because this person is or firm might be a generalist is not necessarily a good thing because it is pretty hard to be all things to all people in any business, but certainly in marketing and branding. Yes. Yes. I think, you know, kind of understanding that person, where they're coming from, where their experience and passion lies. I think that's where you'll find the right consultant. You know, like I said, I have colleagues that focus on a specific type of niche. And I know that, oh, if somebody comes to me and say they are a coach, I know like, oh my gosh, I have the perfect designer that focuses on working with coaches, you know? So she knows Uh what the needs are of a coach and what type of marketing deliverables they need. And so I think that it's fine. You know, if you're a generalist, that's fine that, you know, a lot of people are, but I think, you know, you still want to have a good conversation with that person to make sure that they understand your unique challenges, whatever they may be, and that they can address them. Yeah. Great advice. Well, what do you see for the future of your firm and the future of branding and marketing? Any insights there? Well, definitely, you know, digital branding is the future. I think that we are going to be seeing more ways to engage with a brand digitally, more of that kind of interactive outreach with a brand where it's not like a one-way street of a brand, you know, kind of like in the past, it was like, here's an ad, look at it, you know, Mm -hmm. now it's more of like, oh, here's something that we've you know, we're asking you a question and we want to know what your answer is. You know, there's more of this interactivity between a brand and a consumer or someone in their audience. Um, And I think that there, people will definitely be exploring different ways of engaging for these different audiences. So, you know, maybe a company or a nonprofit will say, hey, you know, we need to be on TikTok. You know, we have like, a younger demographic, or we know that they're in that space and that's where we need to be, you know? So I think that um, definitely being aware of the different ways that you can connect with people, new ways to connect, new ways to create a community. Um, What I see a lot of brands and organizations doing now is sort of building a community around their cause or what they do. And that's really, you know, part of branding, you know, if you have a Facebook group, you are expressing your brand and your mission in that Facebook group. So I think that's also really interesting. I've been seeing some really unique communities through Slack, Facebook groups, of course, uh, other online communities where people can come together. I think that that's really the future, you know, for branding is like making it easier for people to connect with you. And then also, and to connect with each other, other members of the community, like-minded people. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's what we want. We want to bring people together, not just, you know, reach that one person, but yeah, not just buy a product today. You want to create fans basically. Yes, exactly. And repeat think, buyers, repeat donors. Oh, totally. You know, it's much cheaper to get a repeat donation than it is to get a new donor. It's the same thing with sales, right? It's cheaper yeah. to work with an existing customer and keep them as a repeat customer. So I think that's something that's really important as well is remembering to do that follow-up and staying connected. And, you know, digital branding makes that easy. Back in the day when we were doing everything by mail and print, you know, it might've been a little bit harder to keep Mm -hmm. in touch as often with people because, you know, you have to design the piece and you have to print it and hand write letters or notes. And now you really can keep in touch with people personally. You can keep in touch with people through social media, through email. You know, one thing that I've seen in email that I've heard has been really successful for people is asking a question in your email. It's as simple as saying, you know, what do you think about this? Reply and let us know. And people are having wonderful results with that. You know, I do that with my own emails. I've 
you know, heard from other businesses, they've been doing that and they've had amazing results. And of course you need to have somebody who can field those emails and, you know, respond to them and collect them. It's that human and personal aspect. And I think that almost seems a little bit counterintuitive because it's like, it's digital. We're not in front of each other or able to like touch another person, but I think you can still have that human and personal aspect through branding, you know, by making it personalized and video and asking questions and responding to people and interacting with them. So I think that's something else that's in our future is more of that human and personal aspect in digital branding. Interesting. Lydia, I want to make sure you have a chance to tell people how to get in touch with you if they're interested in learning more about Lydia Varesco Design Services or they're just interested in chatting. What's the best way for them to connect and find out more? The best way is uh, my website, which is lsvdesign.com. And you can also send me an email through my website. I am also at LSV Design on social media. I'm quite active on LinkedIn. You know, as I mentioned, I really like LinkedIn, but I'm <laughs> also on the other channels. Lastly, connect with me on LinkedIn. I always love to stay connected since, you know, as I said, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So please connect with me. Well, I definitely will connect with you. Lydia, thank you so much for being with me today and for sharing with my listeners a little bit more about marketing and branding, two very, very important and related topics. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Doris. This was wonderful. I love how in sync our conversation was. This was really great. Amazing. That's a wrap for this week. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. My door is always open for comments. I'd love to hear from you. Just shoot me an email at dnagel at thesavvyentrepreneur.org, and I promise you'll always get an answer back. Be sure to join me again next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. But until then, I'm Doris Nagel, wishing you happy entrepreneuring.